Hello everybody, today the good people at Porsche UK HQ have allowed me to pinch two cars from their fleet and I decided to take two rather exciting cars that were not 911s. In my last video I looked at this, the 680 horsepower Cayenne Coupe Turbo S E-Hybrid. And in this video we're looking at the similarly confusingly named Taycan Turbo. The Taycan has one really big problem. No, it's not the fact there's nowhere to put petrol into it, and it's not even the really silly name. I can only presume that whoever came up with the turbo moniker for this car previously worked for the same marketing department who brought you 4K high definition shampoo. No, the Taycan's problem is a much more simple and philosophical one. What is this car meant to be? Whenever I review a car, I keep in mind what it's trying to be, what it's trying to do, who it's aimed at, and you judge a car's success then based on how it meets those criteria. After all, I would be a terrible car journalist if I was looking at city cars and I said, why don't you get a Lamborghini Urus? Or if you wanted an off-roader, I said, what about a Ferrari 355? But with the Taycan, I just don't get it. What is it meant to be? It's clearly not a sports car. It's got too many doors, too many seats, and it's too big for that. It's obviously not an SUV. It's too low and impractical for that. I don't think really it's an executive saloon because there's not quite enough stowage space in it and Porsche already have the Panamera, which is evidently is not. I will give Porsche some kudos really because unlike Audi, whose e-tron was basically a slightly rubbish Q7, they seem to have put some effort into this one. I guess if you asked the boys and girls at Stuttgart what this car really was, they would tell you, it's the future, dear boy. This is Porsche's vision of things to come. So in that regard, it's probably the most important car they've made since they introduced this thing. In pictures, the Taycan's weird hybrid of sort of sports car and saloon styling just didn't work for me. But here in the flesh, in this beautiful shade of gentian blue, I think it actually really works. Apparently the design team had to fight hard in order to be able to put some headlights on that looked a little bit different to the rest of the Porsche range. And I've got to say, it really does work. It's a, a little flat at the back, but from the front and side, it does actually look like a car with some serious purpose. And it's got a great stance. It's really aggressive, very low slung. That nose drops right down at the front. Very typical thing we're going to see a lot more of with electric cars because they simply don't need to gulp in the same amount of air as these old gas guzzlers. But actually, I think from the looks, it works. For those looking at one of these as a daily driver, the boot space is actually pretty good. It's not horrendous, but it's nowhere near the cavern that you could expect to find in the back of a Tesla. But for business purposes or the short weekend trip away, it's certainly going to do you fine. There's also a much smaller storage space at the front in which you'll probably sort of get one or two very small soft bags. With a starting price of just shy of £116,000, Porsche clearly haven't marketed this car at the Everyman. Granted, this is the Turbo, so it's more expensive than the lesser 4S, but it's also cheaper than the Turbo S that sits above. Of course, as with any press car, this does have quite a few options on it, but unlike their colleagues at Marinello, Porsche have specified this car a little less extravagantly. That being said, there's still about 24 grand's worth of options on this car, bringing the actual on-the-road list price of this specific vehicle to just short of £140,000. And in Porsche tradition, there's a lot on this options list that really, really should be standard. <clears throat> For example, the electric folding mirrors at £210. Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control, I can understand a bit more reasonably, but it's £2,315. That goes along with the rear axle steer that's £1,650 quid, and then the ceramic brakes at just over £4,000. These lovely Mission E wheels, over two grand, but to have the wheels painted in black, another 842 quid. Really? Really? Ah. <clears throat> Thermally and noise insulated glass, £1,300. I mean, okay, that's a luxury thing. Yeah, sure. They then charge you 210 quid for a Type 2 charging cable. 
Other options I do approve of include the admittedly expensive but also very good Burmester surround sound system at just over three grand. You've got four zone climate control for just under 600 quid. And then you find stuff like the heated steering wheel. Again, why is this an option on a 115,000 pound car? But at 189 pound, I guess it's not gonna hurt too much. Then a few other things that I definitely wouldn't specify. Night vision is useless. Nobody uses it. Park assist, uh, yeah, I, I can, I can park myself, but the problem is the park assist also includes the 360 camera, which is quite useful, and that is a thousand pounds or thereabouts. So it's not the sort of 90 grand's worth of options that you might find on a Ferrari, but still, there are things on here that should just be standard. Apparently, Porsche's vision of the future, they expect you to pay for. But my biggest issue with this particular car is the specification inside. I don't know who specified the interior of this car, but I think they were listening to a lot of Radiohead at the time, because this is a symphony in noir. Everything in here, everything is black. In fact, the only splashes of color are the passenger airbag warning on the sun visor, the Porsche crest, and the red button to release your seatbelt. Everything else is black, the leather, the stitching, the switches, the Taycan logo, everything is just relentlessly black. And there's more problems. This nice, clear, high resolution display here, you can't actually see all of, because just like in the new 992 911, the steering wheel obscures a couple of big bits of it. That is a major design fail. In fact, it's only 90 year old Beryl that would actually be able to see all of it, because you have to get your head here if you wanna see everything. There are some nice features as well, like the fact that there are little touch sensitive buttons on the side which show you the status of your lights, your suspension and so on, and enable you to change modes quickly. And that's really handy because the rest of the infotainment and control system is a bit of a mess. You've got two screens here and controls will appear in whichever one they want. There's no obvious way to just simply skip a track from the steering wheel. I mean, isn't that basic? You want volume up and down, which you have, but also track or station backwards, forwards, up or down. It's not here, you have to press a button over there to do that. And it's just, ah, it's painful. There are other very good things though. These seats, very comfortable, very supportive, plenty of adjustment, they are great. The actual driving position itself is superb. The wheel is really nice in the hand and you sit in exactly the right place in this car. You've got a feeling of just gliding along that really is quite sublime. The other big issue I have with the interior, it's this. What is this doing? This is the kind of crappy, scratchy plastic you expect to find in a base polo, not a 140,000 pound Porsche. In fact, this kind of material shouldn't be anywhere in any Porsche. I'd be disappointed if this covered the engine in a basic Boxster. Get it out, guys. It's not the sort of thing you wanna see when you open the cell of a car like this. Just not acceptable. But that being said, I'm quite confident that with a little bit of extra time and money thrown at the options list, you could probably fix most of the issues with that interior. You could certainly make it feel like a more vibrant, warm and cosseting place to be. However, the Taycan's mission is not just to look like a Porsche, but it also has to drive like one. So, does it? Like one of my childhood heroes, this car is both blue and very fast. Having just jumped out of the Cayenne, you do actually feel like you're in a kosher sports car, being sat pretty low down and having a fabulous view of the road ahead. This is also an extremely comfortable car. It's really well damped, and despite the fact that it weighs the same as the Cayenne, but 2.3 tons, it feels much more compliant, in spite of the fact it's also wearing ridiculously huge wheels. And those mercifully are clad in proper tires. No eco-spec nonsense here. You've got proper Goodyear Eagle F1s. And that means that this thing should be pretty darn good at tearing up your favorite B road in nothing but silence with the odd scream from a terrified tire. For the past hour, I've been driving this car on the motorway and it has been rather excellent. Extraordinarily dull interior aside, it's 
fabulous thing to do miles in. Now, that being said, how many miles you can do is always a question that is asked. I would say in a car like this, you're gonna be getting around 200 miles to a tank. I've done about 65 miles already in the car report, 155 still remaining. But we're about to give it a bit of a workout and I expect that range figure to drop somewhat. Are you ready? Here we go. bonkers quick this car. Now the Cayenne's actually doing a pretty good job of keeping up. My buddy James is piloting that behind me. But this delivers a very different experience. It's much more sports car. Oh, the turning is good. That rear axle steer really works and holy hell, this thing can shift. <gasps> it's damped really nicely too. This is... I've never got air there before. <laughs> Oh my word! Yeah, that's... <laughs> oh, okay, and slow down for the town. Now, quite simply, it doesn't deliver you the kind of experience that you're going to find if you're behind the wheel of a classic 911. The steering just doesn't have that texture, that tactility that the finest sports cars do. It is, however, very direct. And the chassis, very communicative. The seats work really quite well, and the powertrain is utterly stonking. It has at its disposal in normal times about 620 horsepower. With launch control activated, it's about 680. And this isn't the quick one. It makes, frankly, a mockery of its 2.3 ton mass. It really does. And it makes things like this absolutely ludicrous transmission selector even forgivable, somewhat forgivable. I mean, it's really stupid. You, you activate it and I, I feel like Anakin Skywalker and that bit in The Phantom Menace where his pod race is broken and he's trying to fix it. That, that's what I feel like. However, I do also feel like Anakin Skywalker in The Phantom Menace during the pod race when he puts his foot down because this thing just shifts you down the road. I mean, it feels as if God himself has decided that you're in the wrong place and that where you really should be is quite far way over there. Interestingly, compared with the KN, it has a more basic suspension setup. McPherson strut at the front with Multilink at the rear. It's the same kind of configuration that you would find in a 911, although I'm reasonably confident the actual components will be nothing alike. I was concerned because McPherson is a reasonably simple setup, which meant that perhaps it would be a little harsher than you might hope, but I needn't worry because this thing is really so nicely set up for covering ground, it's devastating. But it is actually, I genuinely think, kind of fun too. I actually think this could be the most exciting Porsche I have driven in quite some time. I really love the Boxster Spider to pieces, fabulous thing, as I'm sure is the 718 GT4. But in terms of the modern lineup, this thing is absolutely marvelous. I wish I had more time to live with it because I think I could give you a more rounded, honest review. Electric cars in this scenario, I think, tend to always do quite well because they'll impress you with their speed, their capabilities. And I want to drive this car on even more familiar roads just to see how it behaves and how you get on with it. But I've got to say, right now, the Taycan, it's immense. This interior, just not good enough. Really needs to be better. There's some serious design failings on this thing, and I don't know what they were thinking. You know, the air vents don't move. You got the brawn shaver that Anakin uses down here. Just it's all a bit weird. Door handles, nasty, nasty door handles. Very cheap feeling. There's a few just basic bits that Porsche have got wrong, but the crucial bit, the drive, it's pretty good. The steering doesn't weight up quite as much as I would like it to. That is a shortcoming, I would say. 
the master stroke for me though is the damping i don't know how they've done it generally speaking it's pretty hard to get a really heavy car to ride both well and have decent body control the bentley continental gt that i had not too long ago failed on that test because it was just too harsh especially for a bentley this weighs the same as that car and that really should tell you the weight penalty you pay for having an electric drivetrain because this is nowhere near the size of the bentley but it's a lot more fun and it's more comfortable As soon as I'm done here, after we've got the drive-by sorted, I'm going to have to choose which of these two cars I want to drive all the way back. And you know what? It's not a difficult decision to make at all. I'm taking the Taycan. The KN is fun. It's silly. It's over the top. It's a bit mad. This thing... I want more. And I haven't even put it in sport mode. How? How? I nearly finished a review without doing that. Does it improve things? I think it pulls even harder in sport mode, actually. The suspension gets a little firmer, but on this road, that doesn't help. The steering doesn't really seem that much different. Brakes are really good, actually. You know what? That rear steer, you can feel it working, and I'm going to say that's an essential option. Oh! -hoo! Thank you to the guys at Porsche UK for letting me have a go at this. This has been quite enlightening. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment below, tell me what you think of the Taycan. The one big thing, I think, one problem still remaining with this car. I still haven't worked out what it is, but I now know that I like it. Thanks all for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks to Porsche UK for lending it to me. And I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.